Welcome back to Shady Pines Chamber Players' eighth season. We think you'll be happy you joined us for this sweet Baroque soiree trip into the studio of Joel Bechtel. Most of you have already seen Bechtel's artistry as a performer. He is also a historian with many stories from his own experience to tell. We hope this will resonate with especially the music students of Otero County, adding to your journey in music education. Joel recorded these segments where he lives in Albuquerque. We had planned to have our August events on the stage of the beautiful NMSUA Rohovec Theater today, and then on Shady Pines Bertha stage here on Saturday the 22nd for her soiree. Because of the world situation, we decided to combine the two events, knowing that our plans for an educational experience for students and their families would appeal to our audience who love pure high quality music and vice versa. So here we go with the Baroque Soiree speaking to Otero County music students. Please let us know what you think. Make a comment or ask a question as you watch. Either Joel or I will try to answer you as we see remarks being made probably later on. If you are a student and need the cold word to receive extra credit for watching this program, you can find it by watching very carefully as letter by letter that word will be revealed during the program. Please check the description below out to know more about Joel and us and to discover how you can join others to keep our musical dream alive. Here's Joel. Hi everybody. Greetings from Albuquerque. Ever since I saw you last year at about this time I've been really excited about coming back and playing for you again and enjoying that beautiful part of our state but um, alas this year just not to be. Uh, but we still have a lot of great music and some wonderful and interesting instruments to explore so now that we're all used to seeing each other on screens instead of in the flesh I guess uh, this will do for now until we can see each other in person again. The first piece I want to play for you is uh, very exciting to me for a number of reasons and uh, not the least of them is that this is almost a world premiere. Now, I know that sounds strange but um, as far as I know the piece has only been performed once in public and that was in a composition class in the Juilliard Preparatory Division and the performer was the composer Jeevan Ramesh and uh, it's a piece that he wrote in February just a couple of months before celebrating his 12th birthday. And the title is Reflections, and I think at the time he wrote it, probably he didn't know that much about what was to come, but when he talks about it now, what he says is that um, uh, he wrote it as he contemplated the trials and journeys of the past year and how he will meet new challenges, and it anticipates the changes coming due to the coronavirus and the spirit that although life will not be the same, we will carry on. I think it's a lovely sentiment and I think the piece um, is really nice in light of what, uh, what inspired it. So with uh, the composer's thoughts in mind, here is Reflections by Jeevan Ramesh. <laughs>
I love my little studio where I've been playing for you, but I thought I would step out into the garden and introduce you properly to the cast of characters in a more open space, maybe a little less cramped. And um, so here, here they are, and the first cello that I've played on, that you've heard, is the, and the cello that um, most, most concerts are played on these days is the modern cello. And you can see mine has an ultra-modern end pin that has an angle on it. Um, this cello is modeled after a cello from the early 1700s, but the cello that inspired it and the, from which its measurements were taken has been modernized as 99% of all of the cellos from the Baroque era and the classical era have been. They've had new necks put on them. They've been taken apart and been um, structurally uh, strengthened from the inside and they've had their end pins added and most of them have had uh, a number of other changes made to them to turn them into modern cellos. This cello was made in the 1990s in Albuquerque, New Mexico by the world famous violin maker Ann Cole. And uh, not only did she make this cello, but she was my cello teacher from the fourth grade or so all the way through uh, when I graduated from high school and went off to study music uh, full time. So this is a modern cello that has steel strings um, and a, a neck angle that's tilted back a little bit further than its predecessors because one of the goals of modernizing the cellos really in a nutshell was to make them louder. And by getting more pressure on the top of the instrument, by changing out the strings uh, for uh, strings that are made more to project sound than they are to just resonate, um, that's one of the outcomes. So um, let's see if I can gently set this down and move on to the next cello that um, we had tonight. And that's the Baroque cello. So that's this one here. And the, um, as I mentioned, the model for this cello started its life as a Baroque cello and turned into a modern cello uh, as, as uh, uh, the need for that arose. This is a cello I mentioned earlier that was made in actually in the 21st century, but it was made to the specifications of a Baroque cello. So we have a, a neck angle that's more parallel to the body of the instrument. So the strings aren't so high. The strings are gut. They're not technically part of the instrument, but that is part of what makes a Baroque cello. Baroque cello uh, fingerboards tended to be shorter because for much of the Baroque era, nobody played above the neck. Uh, this cello actually um, has a fingerboard that would have been from the late Baroque or early classical period because that's when cello started to play up here. You'll notice no end pin and um, I guess that's kind of the main differences. It's got the lighter structure on the inside and a few other little um, structural details that, uh, that make it a Baroque instrument designed more for, um, for ringing tone and less to fill up a giant concert hall with sound. Let's see here. There's another cello and I think this would be a good time to introduce some terminology because this cello goes by the name violoncello piccolo and the the word cello that we use um, to to refer to the instrument is really just a nickname there's a hummingbird visiting us as we talk um, and you're used to that there in cloudcroft i know um, the uh, cello is a nickname, and it actually is a diminutive, just like ito or ino or something like that, where you would uh, add it to the end of a word to make it sound like something little. So the stringed instruments that are played with a bow all were referred to in some form or other as a viola. So a viola that you played on your legs, those six stringed instruments with frets, those were viola da gamba, which means viola of the legs, right? And uh, a lot of times if you're uh, reading translations, auto, auto translations on the internet, like I do, um, of the viola da gamba, they call it the leg violet because viola is also Italian for the flower violet. Uh, so uh, viola da gamba is the leg violet or the viola that you play on your legs. Um, and then 
the really uh, little one of those got a diminutive of its own. That's a violino, so we call it a violin. And actually not the same family, but, but uh, just to show you how the words are modified. Um, what we refer to as just a viola, like in the orchestra or in a string quartet, that's a viola da braccia, that's a viola of the shoulder, right? A viola that's held up on the shoulder. And the violino is a little version of that, right? And then the really, really big viola um, of the violin family is the violone. And uh, that means a really big viola. One means big. And cello, as I said before, means little. So this instrument that I've been showing you, the violoncello, is the little great big viola. This is the violoncello piccolo, which means it's the little tiny great big viola. And in addition to being a fair amount smaller, and it's also in the Baroque style, this, this instrument went entirely out of style. Um, and this is a, a modern replica. That, this is an interesting thing about the three instruments I'm showing you. Every one of them was actually made for me, which is uh, just makes me feel so, so happy to have them in my life. This was made in Beijing by uh, a workshop that was uh, founded and run by my friend Liu Pong and it even has my name written inside. The first one I showed you, the one by Ann Cole, actually uh, something similar. And then um, the, the Baroque cello over here, I've lost track of where they are. That one was made in Germany by Lothar Zemmler. Again, something I asked him to make and he was kind enough to, uh, he'd never made a Baroque cello before. He'd only made modern cellos. So all three of these instruments came into my family as newborns. Um, and another thing about the violoncello piccolo is, as you can see, it has five strings. So in, in addition to the low strings that every cello has, it has one that goes, whoops, it's very hot out here. So it has not stayed in tune, but it has an E string as well. So this is the little tiny great big viola. And speaking of violas, um, something that I have sometimes played in concerts that I'll show you now is something called, sometimes it's called a vertical viola and sometimes it's called a tenor viola. But in the 16 and 1700s, violas, the, what we now call the viola, which is the viola de braccia, came in two sizes, the tenor size and the alto size. So tenor, of course, referring to the lower middle voice and alto meaning higher than that. And the alto viola is about maybe this big and the tenor viola is what you see here. And it's large enough that it really requires to be played by a seated player. I'm not going to give it its own segment in the concert, sorry. Um, maybe next time. But um, it's larger so that it will be more resonant. And during the same period of time when cellos went from being great big to being merely big, um, that's when violas also, the, the tenor viola just, they stopped making them entirely and made only alto violas from that time on. Um, let's take a little break and then we'll look at some bows. You know, by most standards, the cello is not a particularly modern instrument. It's made out of wood, usually by hand. And the bow is also made out of a special kind of wood with horsehair, and it's, the horsehair is made sticky using rosin, which comes from tree sap. So really, by those standards, it's not particularly modern at all, but this is a modern cello, and this is a modern bow, and that's primarily when they're contrasted with this, which is a Baroque cello, and this is a Baroque bow. And these are the ancestors. This particular cello was made in the Baroque style, and likewise this bow. Um, these instruments are approximately the same age, but this one is made in the Baroque style, and that one's made in the modern style, and likewise with the bow. Um, and a lot of the differences are not visible. The strings are different. These are strings made out of sheep gut rather than steel. Um, this cello doesn't have an end pin, um, and the bow is shaped differently and weighted very differently. Um, and there are some structural differences with this instrument that aren't really noticeable uh, just from, from glancing at it. But this is the type of instrument that 
in the early 1700s, when Johann Sebastian Bach was writing music, uh, was considered the peak of modernity because its ancestors had been much larger and due to an innovation in how strings were made, it became possible to make a low sounding instrument that was a little smaller than it had been before. And so this instrument was somewhat easier to get around for the player and so uh, it became possible to write solos, more, more agile music for this instrument. And that's what Bach did. He wrote six suites, five of them for an instrument like this and one for an even smaller version of it. And um, I thought it would be fun for us to have a listen to what an 18th century cello sounds like and contrast it with what a 21st century cello sounds like. So a little music of Bach from his third suite, the second movement, the Allemande. <laughs>
the um, it's, it's a matter of curiosity for a lot of people why a violin bow or a cello bow is called a bow. And um, the reason is because if you look at old enough ones or bows made in the old enough style, you can actually see that they are, it's a little hard with the backdrop, but hopefully you can see, it's bowed outwards like this and it is reminiscent of a bow for a bow and arrow. And this is an ancestor style bow. It was actually made, I think in the late 20th century. And um, perhaps we'll be able to see if we hold it close enough that it has a fluted um, stick. It's made of extremely dense and heavy wood. And without compromising the strength, it's possible to put these little, um, just like uh, like in, in the columns of the Greek and Roman temples, it is fluted and that helps it reduce its weight and maybe add a little bit of flexibility. This is the bow that I use with the violoncello piccolo. And this is the oldest style of bow, although the bow itself is not antique. Another Baroque bow, the one that I used to play Bach, is this one. And you can see it still has more or less an outward curve, but just the, the distance to the hair is not quite so far. Um, it's not such a long and streamlined and elegant looking bow. It's kind of a, a workaday Baroque style bow from, I would say probably the style is from maybe the mid 18th century or something like that. Um, and then we get to the modern bow, and uh, uh, ironically, the oldest bow on the table here is, uh, the, mo is the modern bow. <laughs> this bow was probably made right around 1900 or so in London by a firm called W.E. Hill and & Sons, and they, they were quite uh, famous for their bows right, through, right well into the 20th century, uh, starting, I think, back in the 18th century. Um, and this bow... Uh, has made it through the wars and found its way to Albuquerque and that's uh, where it lives now. And another version of the modern bow is this one. And this is the one that I use when the composer requires me to uh, maybe to hit the bow against the strings um, or something that might potentially damage a bow. There's, a, there's a, um, an instruction in written cello music when the con composer wants that. It's called Colenio battuto, which means hit the string with the wood of the bow. Well, you can't do it with this bow because this bow doesn't have any wood. Actually, this part's wood. Uh, the rest of the bow is made of carbon fiber. And you can see um, probably by looking at it that it's not made of wood except for the frog, which is made of ebony. And it's, it's got the traditional silver mountings. Everything about it is just like a traditional wooden bow, but, um, but it's not wooden. <laughs> it's just designed like one. And... I think most uh, string players would say, would be somewhere between, I can't stand carbon fiber bows, or, well, carbon fiber bows are good, uh, wood bows you know, often are better. Um, I actually have a lot of respect for carbon fiber bows. I think some good ones are really, really good and fun to play with, and they have the advantage that they're harder to break than wood bows. And then finally, this is a bow that just made a super quick appearance just now. Um, when I played the viola. It's actually a violin bow, and this was made uh, by a Chinese firm, um, and it has a, a frog and the part of the button are, that are made of uh, buffalo horn, which was actually quite common in the 19th century. It's gone out of style. But this person was building a bow in an old style. Um, so a, a violin bow is longer and lighter, so it has greater length, but overall uh, weighs less than a cello bow. So that's a little bit about the bows. Of course, they, they all have horsehair on them. Strangely enough, out of all of the modern innovations here on this planet, no one has come up with a good substitute for horsehair when it comes to bows for stringed instruments. Uh, and again, like uh, in the same way, rosin made out of tree sap, there's, there's no, been no improvement on that. So that's a little bit about the instruments and the bows. After Bach had written the first three suites, he started doing sort of strange things in the composition of works for cello. One is that in the fourth suite, he chose a really surprising key, the key of E flat, which is not a home key for the cello. The fifth suite, he used what has been referred to as Italian or Bolognese tuning. 
So he didn't tune the cello the way uh, the way we do now and the way most cellists did then, uh, but he, he had the strings at different intervals from one another compared to the other four suites. And then when it came to the sixth suite, he wrote it for a different instrument altogether, and it's this one, the violoncello piccolo. It's an instrument that, honestly, I don't know offhand of anyone else who wrote for it. Um, it can be used for playing standard rep, but it's it's smaller, and it has a fifth string, which Bach exploited to a huge extent when he wrote his sixth suite. And uh, in order to give us a chance to listen to this instrument and uh, see how, how different it is, I thought we could play a little bit of that sixth suite. So this is the, um, the courant from the sixth suite. Thank you. 
As you can see, we've had a bit of a change of venue since the other videos. The uh, place where I was recording those is now a COVID quarantine area, which is actually good news. Everybody's fine, and we're thrilled to have my niece back from Morocco. So nevertheless, I'm in a different location to finish off the concert with one more piece. But before I do, I have a word for all of the students watching this video who need a code word to prove their attendance. So you've been getting it in little little bits, uh, I understand, throughout the, uh, the videos, and you should have most of it by now. You might even have figured it out, but the very end of it is coming after this last piece. But here's your hint. Ready for a big hint? The word is Baroque. Okay, you're welcome. And you still have to know how to spell it. Too. So stick around, watch the, uh, the last piece, and get the last couple letters that you need to spell your code word. All right. And speaking of that last piece, it's another piece that I became acquainted of, like the very first one, uh, because I received it over the internet. And this is, I think I can safely say, the one and only time that I have found any practical use for the website LinkedIn, um, because the composer of this piece sent me a message from Paris and said, I noticed on your profile that you are a cello player and I'm a composer and I have a piece for solo cello. Would you care to have a look at it? And I'm just so glad that that message arrived on a day when I had the time to actually explore the piece of music because one does get these, uh, these opportunities from time to time and sometimes your dance card's full and you say, I can't take the time. But that day I had a few minutes and I downloaded the piece and I am so glad I did because I am fascinated by it. It's a terrific piece. The composer's name is Henri Al-Gaddafi and it's a piece he originally wrote for electric guitar and he performs it on, uh, on the internet. I've heard it once and just super exciting and he's arranged it for the cello. It's written in 2018. The title is Ivy Heavily 2 and just uh, a little bit of a hint about what you're about to hear. I have my carbon fiber bow. I hope you enjoy. <laughs>
Well, I've had a great time playing for you. I do wish that it could have been in person in the beautiful mountains of southern New Mexico, but let's uh, keep our fingers crossed that the time will come soon. And until then, everybody stay healthy and happy and hope to see you soon.